Hello and welcome. I'm your host, author Ryan M. Oliver, and this is the Mighty Books Podcast. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Mighty Books Podcast. Today with me, I have Dr. Randy Overbeck. Now, Randy is an award-winning educator, author, and speaker. As an educator, he's served children for more than three decades and has turned that experience into captivating fiction, authoring the best-selling series, The Haunted Shores Mysteries, winner of nine national awards. He is the host of the popular podcast, Great Stories About Great Storytellers, which reveals the unusual and sometimes strange backstories of famous authors, directors, and poets. He's also a speaker in much demand, sharing his multimedia presentations, things to go bump in the night, a few favorite haunts, and everything you wanted to know about publishing with audiences all over the USA. As a member of the Mystery Writers of America, Dr. Overbeck is an active member of the literary community, contributing to a writer's critique group, serving as a mentor to emerging writers, and participating in writers' conferences. Dr. Overbeck, how are you doing today? I am doing great. It's a gorgeous day out here in Ohio, and I'm delighted to be talking with you, Ryan. Awesome. I'm glad to have you here. It's a nice and cloudy-ish kind of partly day here in Washington State, so hopefully we're sharing some good weather vibes. We're here to talk about your new book. What is that title of that new book? The new book is called Cruel Lessons. It's actually the first book in a new series set in schools called Lessons in Peril. Uh, The book is a uh, atmospheric amateur sleuth mystery about a um, drug pusher pushing drugs into a middle school and the uh, work between the school people and uh, their officer to figure out who's behind who's poisoning children and get him and to stop before more kids die. More oh, kids man. die. Man, that sounds serious. It's not gloomy. It's not eerie, but it's very, it, the topic is very serious. Oh, absolutely. Now you said you had I mean, 30 years or more than 30 years of being an educator in the schools. What age group did you work with? Well, I, I was a, um, I taught high school and junior high and college for 12 years. Oh, wow. And then I ran school districts for 28 years. So I was assistant superintendent and superintendent in four different school districts in 28 years. Oh my gosh. So I imagine that the inspiration, this obviously pulls from your educational background, educator background, but like any of the stories that we would read in there, are they like based on true events? They're not based on true events, but they are similar to things that, well, not in, in the first three books, there are, those are paranormal mysteries. So that's okay. a little, that's a whole different subject. But this new book is based on events I, I encountered over my 28 years. There were numerous times where we had drug issues in the schools and we had to deal with that. Now, the actual storyline, no, that's it's fiction. But okay. the kinds of things that are going on and the people involved and that kind of stuff. And the characters that I've created are all based on composites of people I work with. Oh, um, yeah. Both mostly good, but some not so good. So, yeah, you're going to find a lot of, you know, breed of human, regardless of where you work. And I mean, I I worked in education for for quite a while. I still am in it as a trainer with a naval base. But I mean, there's only three of us who teach versus at a school of, you know, hundreds, potentially, especially in a school district. So you have a lot more to pull from, (laughs) I imagine. And 95 percent of those people are just like me. They're in it to serve children. They want to do what they can for those kids. But there's always a few that that's are outside that norm. And and I and the one thing that's very different about this book is that every all of the all of the good guys and all the bad guys are all school people. Oh, OK. OK. Sorting through, trying to figure out, well, who's on whose side here and what's going on. So that's part of the fun of the read. Yeah. A good old whodunit mystery. Yeah. I like those. I like those, especially when you have all the suspects right there. There's there's something said between like you can really put this one person on a pedestal as like, they would never do that. They're the best person. And then the twist is, holy cow, they're actually a darker human being than you ever thought they would ever be. I love pulling the blanket out from other people. The professional reviewers are just coming in and a number of them have talked about that. They, they, oh, it's this person. No, 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 it's not that person. Oh, it's this person. Oh no, it's not that person. It takes a lot of, it takes a lot of talent to do some misleading writing like that too. It's a very complicated process to create effective red herrings that are not obvious or not that are organic to the story put it down you didn't just stick something in 
Yeah, I've read some some books that I mean, halfway through, I know who did it. And it just it turned out to be this person I'm like, well, that was I mean, the story was well, you know, written, but it was just that element of it, of surprise yeah. of the the plot twist wasn't there. It was more like a plot hallway. I could see the entire way through it. You know, what I mean, it's just not not something I yeah, I need to learn. I would love to learn more about that. So like what is what does it take to develop a good red herring character and write so it's not super obvious who the who the culprit is? The strategy that I used for the very first book in the previous series, the Haunted Shore Mystery series, I, the strategy is a little different for this one. I'll tell you in a minute, but I, yeah. this worked for me. So what I did in that case was I created three or four potential villains. So in the first book, it's about a murder that took place some 30 years earlier. Uh, a kid is lynched in a high school and this town covers it up and said it's been suicide. So the character's motivation is trying, first of all, he's being haunted by the ghost of this kid that died. So he's trying to figure out who was actually behind the lynching. Right. But what I did on purpose was I had three or four people for whom it could be. And I purposely did not decide who the bad guy was until I was 75% of the way through the story. Oh, interesting. Interesting. So I made sure that any of these three, three or four people could well have been the linchpin in terms of who was the leader of this group. Interesting. And doing that, it kept the threads all the way through, you know, and then of course, when I finished, I had to go back and make sure that, that I lead all this in. So that's that I'm not really a planner, but that part has to be planned. Or if it's not planned, if you're an organic writer, when you finish, you got to go back and go, did I do this? Let's check this thread. Let's check that. Well, I like that you do it that way because you have, like you said, you have, you're building the evidence against those two or three people. And so the reader's going, well, it's this person, obviously, because X, Y, Z. And they go, oh, darn it. It might be this person because of A, B, C, D. And then by the, by the end or by the three quarters of the way through or nearly the end before the reveal, you really don't know which of the three done it. Like that's, that is to me is very well done. I would have thought you'd had the person right up to par already and then you'd have to aim it at that for the story. So, well, and, and when I have learned from other writers that they, what they do is they actually write the ending first. So they know oh. who the bad is and then work backwards. Oh, that makes sense. And that works for them, but it doesn't work. It does, that, that is not something that works for me. So like, yeah, deconstruction of the story. Yeah. Yeah. Now the, the, in the new book, it's, I, I use a slightly different technique because I kind of knew who I wanted the bad guy to be and stuff. So, but I, I use the same kind of things about tracking and making sure that this teacher could have been the possible, this one could have been, you know, so. Cool. Uh, and I, based on the reviews, it obviously worked. That's, yeah. that's what I want. So. Yeah. Yeah. I love to check it out. Actually. I love a good, love a good uh, mystery. Is, is that mystery horror or just mystery? Oh, this, the new one is just an amateur sleuth mystery. It's okay. Just, okay. The most okay. of the investigation is being done by the assistant superintendent of the school district. And a little bit, the fourth grade teacher gets involved in part of the investigation too. Awesome. And then when he's, when he's struggling, he brings in the dare officer to help him out. So. Oh, very cool. I love that. Now, what, what drew you to mystery? Cause you said you did paranormal, uh, Mystery. Uh, mysteries. My first, parano- well, my very first book, which was published 10 years ago. Okay. Uh, was thriller. So oh, about a great. Of high school here in Ohio. It did very well. One thriller of the year when it came out and stuff. Great. Um, it's called uh, Leave No Child Behind. Okay. So, and it's about a terrorist cell that takes over a building in in a, in a high school here in Ohio. And the teacher and a uh, volunteer who happens to be a Navy SEAL that takes on the terrorist cell one by one. So, nice. 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 But I, and I and I like doing that. And I'm. Um, but I'm a very eclectic reader and eclectic writer. So the last three have been paranormal mysteries. Now they are primarily a mystery. In fact, what what made those very interesting is they're really, it's a very different kind of mystery because what happens in those stories, like the one I was starting to tell you about, Blood on the Chesapeake, yeah. when Daryl encounters this, he has no idea who the victim is. So, you know, in a typical mystery, the, the rule is you have to have a dead body on the first on the first page or in the first chapter, whatever. Generally, yeah. And he does encounter the dead person. He encounters this ghost, but he has no idea who this ghost is. So part of the unraveling of the mystery is first find out who the victim is, then what happened to the victim, and then who done it to the victim. So um, all of those elements are in each of the first three Haunted Shore Mystery series. So, so in this one, of course, it's not paranormal. It's just regular school 
although it, I did keep it in the same uh, decade. I happen to like setting, well, I, I like setting the stories in the 90s. I, I have an organic reason for why I did that, uh, and it works very well. I wanted to use the 90s. So in, in the case of the new book, Cruel Lessons, uh, the story takes place in, in fall of 1995, and I use that because that was a very pivotal time in schools where we had very ineffective drug diversion programs. So okay. we, it, was a year, it was a time of the just say no programs and the dare programs. And we know now on research that those had virtually no effect on. Yeah, I remember those coming in. <laughs> so I wanted to kind of use that as a microcosm that, it, it, that, that the story is actually a metaphor. So when people have read it now, they will say, well, I can see right now how the current opiate problem and the heroin problem is just similar to what you created in this story in the 90s interesting so, and by putting it in the past i kind of get rid of all the political stuff that surrounds anything that's current that's a good know? idea too well and i also like when you set a story in the earlier decades because like yes it's fun to read the current stuff but when introduction of technology like especially cell phones comes in you eliminate a lot of the drama i feel like well if i can't if i have someone dying in front of me because they got shot by a bad guy today i pull my phone out calling one one drama yeah it's still going on but it's remote mostly over okay you're applying pressure they show up they take them off the hospital they're fine when you know even in the 90s when cell phone technology wasn't exactly amazing they were still there it was not great so the drama's there now this person has a real potential for dying or great peril or whatever and and you look at all those other stories of mysteries or thrillers that are based earlier in lot in history it's a lot more it's like why can't, why can't they just call somebody they can't there's literally no technology for that so it adds to that suspense that drama it pulls people the edge on the seat feeling so i really respect that you're going to the 90s too so well and it's really funny because some of the younger reviewers had said I had to reset my mind or when you read this, you might have to reset because in the story there technology is, but what's happening is the, the people are just learning to use email. It's yeah. not, I mean, some people are very facile with it. Others are just learning. There's uh, one use of a, of a car phone. Okay. And there are pagers being used. In oh story. yeah. So people are going, what the heck is a pager? You know, oh man. <laughs> Do you have to have like a glossary or index for technology? Oh, for the you know, I thought about that, but I didn't do that. So oh, I figured you're just going to have to go out and get it on their own. But I, I like what it. I call the MASH effect. You yeah. remember the, the show MASH that was oh, yeah. a fantastic show. And the MASH was supposedly supposed to be about the Korean War, but it was really a satire on the Vietnam War that was going on without ever mentioning Vietnam or getting into all that. So I kind of use that same technique. Oh, in my okay. say, okay, well, let's talk about the problem of today, but we'll put it in the context of the past to make it easier to discuss. That's really interesting that you you'll kind of put that nest egg in there, and it's based off of that. I mean, and when you really look at the the reports and everything, they really did those programs really did not yeah. do much. They were hitting it so hard because when, when I was a kid, I went to elementary school in the nineties, and I remember those those programs and people were rating reciting all this poetry and these stories and saying how drugs are bad, yada, yada, yada. And I mean, Mothers Against Drunk Driving, that stuff too came up because I'm going to kind of couple the alcohol with the drugs, obviously. Yeah, and right. I remember it just, it was just so heavy in our culture during that time. And it, I don't feel like it did, it, it didn't do much at all. Like, no, the research says that it, the, here's what the research says. Research says that the D.A.R.E. program did a nice job, did an actually good job of helping improve kids' attitudes toward toward cops, but didn't do much about drugs one way or the other. Didn't help, didn't hurt. The Just Say No program had virtually no statistical impact on the decrease of use of drugs. Yeah. Because it's kind of a dumb program. Just say no, you know, that's so, and what I do in my story is I have a, a rogue hallucinogenic drug that's similar to LSD that the kids can get and apply in a tattoo on their arm. Oh, okay. The thing has ever been, just thank heaven. Yeah. And then because of that, then they steal a car and, and they wreck the car and they all die and stuff. So that, but that makes kind of a good comparison to what they would do if they could get their hands on some of the stuff floating around now. So Right, right. Well, it kind of reminds me of like the, uh, oh, what do you call it? 
the forbidden, the forbidden apple or forbidden fruit. Yeah. Yeah, you know maybe. what I mean? Like, well, because when you when you talk about, I know when I was growing up, it was like, no, 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 everything's no, right? Everything's no. So, for for my mother was lucky because my siblings and I were like, yes, ma'am, okay, we'll make sure we don't do that because we just we 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 listen to her. Now there's other friends of mine who's like, no, it must be good. Like, no, I want to check this out. Right. Yeah, so that, that forbidden fruit effect, it just it just eats at you. Well, why? So for like, I've, I've employed things with my kids. Like, well, here's the thing. It's like, here's what it does. Right. Here are the facts. You can make up your own opinion. Now, here's what will happen if you do this and this and, and lay everything out of line. So there's no mystery. Right. There's no, there's no stigma of, of curiosity. That curiosity is gone because they've got all their questions answered. So it you know removes the mystery, which in this case, we want mystery, we want all the mystery. What drew you to mystery though? I've, I've been a mystery lover for a long time. I, as a reader, I'm very eclectic. I, I, I love mysteries. I love thrillers. I love, I, I, I enjoy some science fiction. I, I, I really have gotten into historical fiction. I like historical fiction a lot. Yeah. That's some of my favorite. Uh, so I, all of those range of things that I like. And uh, this idea, the, the very first mystery that I, that I did, the Blood on the Chesapeake, this kind of came, we were, my wife and I visited they used to enjoy the Chesapeake Bay several times. I really love that area. Yeah. And it just kind of, uh, the idea came to me as I was walking around checking places out and going, you know, this would make a good story. I, the Chesapeake Bay area is absolutely a gorgeous area. It's our favorite place in the U.S. to, to uh, vacation. And yeah. it's a really interesting place because it's got kind of a dual personality. So it's kind of like New Englandish progressive on one hand, and then you go 10 miles down the road and there's Confederate flags hanging everywhere. So they can't really decide what they are. So I use this kind of push-pull thing. And I said, well, it'd be great to create a mystery of something that happened. And then when I did the research of the area, I found that there were two lynchings that actually occurred in this area a couple of decades earlier than my story. But they actually had occurred. Well, and the people, experts have told me that well, there were probably more than that. They just they weren't documented. All of those pieces came together and went, okay, well, what if... He has to solve the mystery of what happened to. Them. So my my characters are motivated because he cares about kids. So here's this black teenager, seven great big teenager who terrifies everybody else who sees, who sees the ghost because he's so huge, and he's naked because that's how he was lynched. Um, uh, and he, and this and my character is a teacher and going, you know, I I got to find some way to help this guy. Yeah. That leads him to trying to find out what's behind the story. And, you know, so it's it was a lot of fun. It's it's fun for me to kind of wrap, wrap the mystery around mm -hmm. and see if I can do it in a way that keeps readers glued to the page. Yeah, no kidding. Now, what drew you to doing paranormal mysteries, particularly? You know, that was an accident, as a matter of fact. I really wasn't going to do that initially. And I was at a writing conference. <laughs> this is actually funny. I was at a writing conference in Indiana. And the session I wanted to go to canceled. You know, sometimes somebody doesn't show up. And sure. And I'm going through, and well, what should I go? Well, there was a con there was a presentation by uh, Central Indiana, Indiana Paranormal Society, and I went, eh, what the heck? Uh, I yeah. And they blew my mind. I just what they what I learned from them was just absolutely incredible. First, kind of what they do, the professionalism with how they approach of what they're doing and stuff, but what they learn and stuff. So that kind of got me kind of into it going, well, what if I had put this little angle in there? Uh -huh. And I have read ghost stories. I'm not a huge fan of ghost stories because my ghost stories are not like, so I don't know if you've ever read ghost fiction. A little bit. Ghost fiction, there's really two kinds of ghost fiction. There's these, what I call the Stephen King variety. You know, the the ones where the, you, you're you terrified, you know, yeah. that, that they keep you up all night, Okay which all have all these malevolent spirits, which incidentally, there's almost no basis in truth for that. Mm -hmm. And the, you have what I call Casper the Friendly Ghost Fiction, which is usually a cozy mystery where the ghost helps solve, they help solve the mystery. And then, okay, well, that there's no basis in truth for that either. Right. So what I tried to do is I tried to limit my ghostly appearances to what's actually been documented. So yes. ghosts don't talk, the ghosts don't solve any mysteries, the ghosts are able to, to lead my character in a way that he's able to uncover something. Oh, okay. So, so it's like more like a clairvoyant kind of thing. Uh, well, he will see and the ghost will leave a message of some kind. Okay. Uh, 
but it is not able to say, here's who killed me, go get him, you know. I, yeah, that would make a really short mystery, I think. Yes, exactly. <laughs> this guy did it years ago. Oh, okay, well, go get him. Well, that, that was four pages. That, that's not very, not very enticing at all. <laughs> we were talking before we hit record about your podcast, because you have one as well. Uh, can you talk a little about your podcast? Yeah, sure. Um, I have a podcast. Uh, it's a year and a half old now, I think, uh, called Great Stories About Great Storytellers, where I do research on famous authors, directors, and poets that the name everybody knows. But I do the research in addition to telling about why they are famous and why they are successful. I talk about things that almost no one knows about that yeah. or very few people would know about that. So what I tell them is like Paul Harvey, the rest of the story only is about authors, poets, and directors. And I do a whole range. I do, um, I do modern authors. I've done uh, my, re I've done JK Rowling cool. very recently. I do John Grisham, did Tom Clancy. Okay. I do directors like Steven Spielberg and Walt Disney. Nice. Uh, poets like Shel Silverstein. I also do classic authors like Mark Twain. So it's a, and I try to make the, make it a wide variety of guys, women and men. And I try to find somebody that's a kind of an interesting story and a story behind the guy. This month I'm doing Alfred Hitchcock. Oh, cool. Oh, right. So. Yeah, that's awesome. How did you just get started on that? You're like, I just want to do a podcast on this. You're just interested in well, history. I, had decided, I thought, I thought, it, well, I looked around, there's nothing like that out there. So I, I kind of checked podcasts to see if anybody was doing something like this and I couldn't find anything. And I thought, you know, I think there might be a niche for this if I can get it out and do it in a way that, that people will respond to. And there yeah. And it's growing. It's not growing as much as I'd like, but it's growing. And the response has been very positive. So I'm kind of, I'm kind of thrilled. And I've got, and what I do is I do a sponsor. So each episode, I, I, I don't really sponsor. I have a sponsor. I have a partner. There's no money involved. So okay. I will do a brief ad for somebody else's podcast or uh, my publisher sponsored one of them, a library sponsored one of them. And then they share my podcast with their audience, whatever that that's a good idea, whatever their social media audience is or whatever newsletter audience is, yeah. but that helps get the word out. So that's really, that's actually a really smart idea. I love doing that. Well, that's kind of what we do What I do with this is because as I talk to more people, more people learn about it and it's just kind of a natural organic growth. So that's actually really smart how you're using your, using the connections around you and that same audience yeah. to spread the word. Cause there's so many podcasts. It's hard to break through it is. and because and yeah. it, there's so many good ones out there that it just, people don't know about because they're just, it's just so saturated with, with shows. What's, what's one of your favorite uh, good, odd stories of the authors or directors? What's one of your favorite ones? Um, Let's see, which one? Well, the one that I, I tell this is actually the first episode and it's part of my, uh, you mentioned uh, I do book talks, yeah, uh, presentations on a regular basis. And the first one I do is called Things That Still Go Bump in the Night. And at the end of that, I tell the story of John Grisham. And he's one of the most interesting characters. So I don't, <clears throat> I'll do that for you because I can do it in about two or three minutes here. So sure, John Grisham, everybody knows John Grisham now, but yeah. in 1989, or actually 87, 88, uh, John Grisham was, is, I guess, a very successful lawyer and a member of the House of Representatives of Mississippi, a really busy guy. And he had sat in on a uh, rape trial that had inspired him to create this, his first story called A Time to Kill. And so your listeners kind of get it. This is important. So the story is about, many people have seen the movie, not as many people have read the book, but stories about two idiot rednecks who find this 12 year old black girl raper drag her behind their on her truck on a chain and yeah. kill her oh her dad finds who that is and kills the two boys what i tell people when i'm doing this is i haven't spoiled it for you that happens in about 11 pages that's how yeah. john Grisham writes the story is actually what happens to the town as a result of the trial yeah this would be southern mississippi it's in mississippi where or southern town anyway so he wrote this book in 87, 88, tried desperately to get it published. No one was interested. He told us at a conference I was at that if you go to his office in Mississippi, which none of us are going to get there, one wall of his office is papered with rejection slips from agents and editors and publishers for that book. Wow. Somewhere along the line, 
eventually he got a Christian press in Florida to publish the book. Now, I tell my listeners, now imagine what the story is about and think about who the Christian press in Florida in 1989 was where readers would likely be. Uh -huh. uh, they, they did what was standard in those days. They ran a 5,000 copy run. That's what you did in 1989. You were a publisher. And the book sat on a shelf and did not sell. Oh. John was literally beside himself. He could not believe this because he was convinced that he was going to be a writer. He quit his job. I tell my audiences that I imagine that was an interesting conversation around the dinner table. Oh, I yeah. Put me through law school but I want to do this writing thing. And he went to the publisher and he got boxes of books and the books uh, and he put books in the back of his car and drove around the South from small bookstore to small bookstore and said, just put four books up. If they sell, send the money to the publisher. If they don't sell. I'll come back and get them. Mm -hmm. Anyway, along that sojourn, he somehow a, an agent in Florida got a copy of this book, a time to kill, read it, liked it, eventually got back to John and said, well, I know you got to publish for this book already, but are you working on anything else? John said, well, I'm just finishing my next book called The Firm. And the rest, of course, is history. So, wow, that's really it, cool. It, was, it exploded. So I, that's kind of an interesting backstory that people don't know about John Grisham. And that's yeah. the kind of thing that I will uh, drop on about an author or, or a poet or. Yeah, that's really cool. And I mean, like, how did your your research? Now, I'm mean, like, whenever I look and do research, I ha I get a little overwhelmed with how much information there is. How long does it take you to a gather those resources and b search through the credible ones to create your episode? How long about does it usually take you? Uh, it'll take me a couple of hours every month to be able to to collect the research. What I do is I just kind of start go out, going out and getting stuff that I can find from viable sources for the author. And I don't I don't really pay a lot of attention to organizing it. I just pull it in and put it in a document and yeah. send it there. And then I will let it, and I read it, of course I read it all, but oh, I will yeah. let it sit there kind of percolate in my brain because I'm trying to find this nugget of, okay, well, what would be the kind of backstory that would be kind of fun to yeah. put in? Do you remember Paul Harvey, the rest of the story? You're probably too young for mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Okay, well, so he always had this, and his was only five minutes, but he always had to sing it at the very end after the commercial went, oh, now the rest of the story. So I, I tell the kind of mostly the stuff, well, people will know some of what I tell in the top part, but they won't know a lot of it. You know, I'll tell about awards and tell about what is what their life was and stuff like that. But then at the end, then I will bring the rest of the story part in the end. So it, it may it may take me, Ryan, I, I it, sometimes it might take me a week to look sure. over that and go, Oh, here's the kernel that I'm going to use for that yeah. for the book at the end. So cool. Actually, sit down to write two hours, maybe, to yeah. create something that's about eleven minutes long in the end. Okay, well that makes sense. Um, I was I Paul Harvey actually inspired uh, you know Mike Rowe. Yes. Yeah, he did his show uh, the way I heard it, and he's got hundreds of very similar episodes like you have but it's it's across the board it's not just uh, dictated to directors and it's yeah. very well done so like, if it's something like that i mean it it would be very interesting so i need to look you up and start listening to that because i think that'd be fun to learn more because this is kind of right up my alley too with what i do and just more learning that way i can bring more to the conversation uh when when we have uh, those particular topics come up There's more right. and more i to try help. really hard to make it so that the, you know so like i've done ian fleming who's if you don't remember that name, James Bond, James Bond, you yeah. know, so Shel Silverstein, who is, uh, you know, do, have, you, have you got those books for your kids? Where the um, sidewalk ends? We don't have any here, but there's some in my wife's classroom. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and like, for example, he was a uh, big playboy. Uh, really? <laughs> he was big, good friends with Hugh Hefner and lived in the Playboy Mansion. So it's all, you know, so they're all kinds of interesting. No way. <laughs> you don't know about. Her. You don't think of children's poetry no. <laughs> and Playboy in the same sentence. No, you Unless you're thinking of some kind of jail. <laughs> in fact, some of his first work written, published stuff was in Playboy magazine. Not. No way. That yeah. is hilarious. Yeah, I got to so, look. I got to look your stuff up. That's, that's the kind of stuff that, you know, I'll find a nugget that I think will be will work really well. Is, you know, 
Wow. Okay. Yep. I'm going to, you sold me. I got to go and find your stuff and start listening, sharing that around too. That's you really know, cool. How did Tom Clancy go from being a life insurance, some kind of an insurance salesman to the number one tech, tech thriller writer in, in the world? You know, well, insurance about the details. So yeah. that makes you sense know, a little bit. I, I, I was so impressed with him. I don't know if you read the Hunt for Red October. That was I have seen the movie. movie. I have I actually have the book, but I don't I have you not need to read, read the yet. book. And when you read the book, I want you to think this man has never stepped inside in a submarine. Oh, my gosh. So yeah, now when he wrote that book, he had never stepped inside a submarine. Right. You there know, was um, there was it might have been. No, it wasn't. It couldn't have been Tom Clancy. I don't remember, but there was another author or writer of some sort when the nuclear power came to be a huge, when nuclear submarines became a thing. Um, oh, Rickover, Commander Rickover, Admiral Rickover. Admiral Rickover. Yeah, yeah who was basically the father of yes, you know, nuclear powered submarines. There was some magazine that came out, some just fiction about some, not necessarily a, a uh, mission, but of how things worked. Right. They found this guy. They're like, hey, how do you know this? And he's like, I have no idea. I just came up with it in my mind. <laughs> they're like, this is this is serious. If you've ever read, um, oh goodness, what is that submarine book now? Blind Man's Bluff. If you've ever read Blind Man's Bluff, it's no, in that. No. That one is a good one. If you like military history, that one is really good. Blind Man's Bluff, it talks about it in that. Book. Is that World War II history? That World War II? Um, it is actually the submarine era starts back in World War One, oh, all okay. the way up to the oh, current. I would say the early nineties. Oh, this is history, not fiction. Yeah, this is yeah. history. This is history. So yeah, way it's just crazy. So Tom Clancy pulling. I I'm just I'm kind of laughing at that. That's just so funny how uh, our imaginations and history are kind of kind of reality kind of come together. <laughs> And, and he will tell you he did all kinds of research and study guides. Yeah, to figure out where you know. But but I did not learn that he had not been inside a submarine till after I read the book, and I could not believe that. I said, "No, you couldn't write this if you didn't." Because that it's is so, so much, funny. You are in the head of the people who are actually walking around in the submarine and going, "How did he do this?" Magic. It's just magic. That's what I'm going. I'm going to I'm going to leave it up to paranormal mysteries and magic. Yeah, that's there you right. go. <laughs> So you're also a speaker as well. Yeah, I do. I, any place that I travel, if I'm, I, 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 uh, I do a couple of programs. Um, done two that have been connected to my haunted shore mysteries. Uh, first one is called uh, "Things Still Go Bump in the Night," and it's a discussion about how ghosts are embedded in our culture. What oh, okay. Ghosts are actually part of our culture that people may recognize. Yeah. And um, the second one, which is more regional, I do it by region, called A Few Favorite Haunts, where I pick out some very interesting stories of actual mm. haunted places in the area yeah. and do that. So it's that's kind of fun. Yeah. Uh, the third one that's, that you mentioned is a new one. It's, I only I gave it for the first talk this two weeks ago. Uh, it's called Everything You Want to Know About Publishing But Couldn't Care to Ask. It kind of unveils, takes the veil of how books get published and how many books are but like it's an interactive one that i do with my audiences and i throw a bunch of questions yeah. at them how many books do you think how many titles do you think were published last year oh so many i, I don't think i could hundreds I of guess, thousands I, I don't have to guess i give them a moment of choice yeah I almost guess here's the answer four million oh titles. i was way off oh my four gosh titles today there will be eleven thousand new titles drop into your amazon basket Jesus, that's so, insane. Oh, now, I, okay, so here's another, I'll throw another piece in there. So so you, uh, anybody listening would be interested. Um, another question I give them is, of those individual titles, I said, remember when you're in Amazon, you're coming up and it says, you might like these books. I said, take a guess as to how many on average, how many copies on average of an individual title are sold on Amazon. Per title? One title. Oh my gosh! I mean, it Take depends if they're blood on the Chesapeake, for oh, example. Oh God, I don't, I don't know. The the answer is six. Six. Yeah, I knew it was small. Six. And my that includes, God, that includes all the time. That includes super bestsellers that sell millions of copies. Wow. It tells you there's a lot of books being dropped that sell three copies: one to the author, one to his mom, and one to his girlfriend. You know. How yeah. 
That's oh. insane. Well, that's kind of what this this uh, podcast is for, too, because between the Ryan's ramblings that I run and then this one, it kind of opens the veil to talking to so many different people, the struggles, the the hardships, the wonder, the greatness, the, the joy of it, the downsides of it. It kind of just it breaks open those. What is it? You know, the, the mystery of it all. And that's kind of a part of this, too, is you talk to so many different people. You get so many different experiences, some good, some great, some not so good, but mostly it's just the writing process uh, that we're writing and publishing process, trying to break down those walls. When I'm working with, I've, I've mentored a number of emerging writers. And when I work with them, one of the things I tell them up front is, look, if you're doing this because you think this is going to be a, a reliable or sturdy revenue stream, go right. and do something else. Yeah, no, it's not. You, you only do this because you love it. Yep. You don't do it because... You think you're going to make a fortune doing it? Um, yeah, no. It, and once it, I, I said, happen. "Well, then, why in the world would you spend all this time?" Because they they asked me, "Well, how long did it take you?" I said, "Well, probably took me a year and a half to get this book from where I first imagined it to getting it somebody ready to publish it." Yeah. And he said, well, "Why would you do that?" And this was my answer. I said, "Here's why." I said, "I was at a book signing where some guy came up to me and was very angry with me, and he said, "I'm mad at you." I said, "What did I do?" I never I hadn't met this guy before. He said. You cost me a whole night's sleep. You know that? He said, I opened your book up and I was going to read one chapter. Damn, I couldn't go to bed the whole night. I kept reacting. That's why I do it for that yeah. kind of reaction. Yes. Yeah. That just that pull of the story really, it, it's a magical thing. It really is. It really is. It gets that blood flowing. It gets the imagination going, not just for you, but for your readers too. And that is just, it's, it's a, it's like a drug. It's like a, coming you, full circle. <laughs> You know, if it's what they are interested in, what I want and what they want, yeah. and, and I can satisfy that, that makes it worth all the all the hassle and struggle you go through to make it, make the product the best you can and put it out there and see what happens. Right, exactly. Now, so if you had to give a tip to any budding mystery writers out there, what would you, what tips would you have for them? Well, I, I think I would, I usually give the same advice regardless of what you're writing, because I think there are two things that are, that I have found most critical to uh, my growth as a writer. The first is if they have not yet been to a writing workshop or writing conference, they need to go. They need to spend a couple hundred bucks, find one that's in the area or relatively close or whatever, and then go. You know, it, it, it is an expense. It is, but you connect with people who are, you'll be surprised, people who are behind you, not even where you are. And then you'll connect with, and with, people way ahead of you one of the, some of the my i made good friends with some f fabulously successful writers just by going to a writers conference and yeah. talking with them kent kruger i don't know if you know who william kent kruger is but he's a mm -hmm. number one best-selling mystery writer he has a series of 19 books wow in a series called uh, the cork o'connor mystery set in northern minnesota of all places it's fascinating and he is a good friend and a good mentor, and I learned a whole lot from him. He sponsored one of my podcast episodes. Oh, cool. So, and you, and I have found that almost all of the writers, Hank Philby Ryan is a, another great mystery writer that's a friend of mine. James Ben, who writes historical mysteries. And all these people that, when I went to conferences, I was amazed at how friendly they were, how generous they were with their time and their advice. And yeah. So, and, and then you learn, of course, you learn all about the craft, you learn about marketing, you learn all this stuff that you really need a, as a writer. So that's my first piece of advice. The second piece of advice, which is maybe even more important, if they haven't yet found a really strong writer's group, yeah. a writer's critique group, they need to do that. Right. Um, I can tell you very honestly that my work is several layers better because I have a good writer's critique group who will... Well, they're, they're not afraid to tell me, well, this is good, but this part isn't working and you could do this better. And it, I mean, and and I take those criticisms to heart because it comes from a good point. And, and, and I'll be honest, well, they see things I would never see. Yeah. I, I, you know, I, and so those two pieces of advice, I think, work for wherever you are in your writing process. You'll gain sig significant improvement from the from both the writing conferences and from a writer's group. Awesome. Excellent. Yeah. Always having that external voice and mind and uh, more eyes tends to be better. I really just, it doesn't, it helps improve working with a team almost 
really, yeah. I feel like helps a lot. Um, cause like you said, you, you see things in your perspective, someone's going to come from a different angle, different experiences. They read your stuff, go, this is great. However, whatever. And then you go, holy crap. I didn't even think of this. Now I can morph it to better encapsulate the story. So I love that. Now, where can people, if they want to buy some books, some good thrillers, some good paranormal mysteries, or just a plain old good mystery, where can they find your books? I would direct them to my website, which is just www.authorrandyoverbeck.com. Right. That's a one-click thing. They'll take them to whatever whatever vendor that they would like. If they want Amazon, they want Barnes & Noble, they want Apple Book, all of them. Uh, the first, the three books in the series are available on uh, print, ebook, and audio. Okay. Uh, the new book is only available in print and ebook yet. It's in a, it's in the process to be audio. Nice. And the first book, the original book is only print and audio. But any whichever their preferences, they can get them easily from there. www.authorrandyoverbeck.com. All right. Awesome. Well, thank you very much. Guys, I hope you go get those wonderful books. I know I'm going to go check out his podcast. That's for sure. And I'll, I want to read your newest one. That's uh, it's coming out or it has, it is out. It just came out. It just dropped on the publisher released it on Wednesday. Wow. We are okay. Friday, so two days ago. It's nice. Nice. So yeah, mid, mid October. So what is that? The 11th it came out. 11th, October, yes. October 11th of 23. That's awesome. Congratulations, by the way, because those are, it, it's not an easy feat to get books out. It's just not, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of dedication, a lot of time. So if anyone's done any kind of writing in the past, you know full well that it is a huge process. So Randy, this has been really great. I really appreciate you coming on and chatting with me today about your about your books. Well, thanks for having me, Ryan. I really enjoyed the conversation and uh, I look forward to hearing, hearing what your listeners think of my books. I do too. I love hearing good good feedback from people. And then as you progress through your author career, you've got more stuff coming out. I'd love to invite you on for another interview when you get some more work out. I think it'd be really cool to to chat some more. I expect to have another book out next year. It's all, actually the book is 90% finished already, so wow. uh, uh, sometime probably in 24 it'll be out. That's amazing. Congratulations again on that. Again, it takes a lot of work, a lot of work, a lot of dedication and a lot of passion for it. So and it's very obvious. It's very obvious. All right, guys. I hope you really enjoy this conversation. Please go get some awesome literature. Check out some really cool stories. Uh, great stories about great storytellers, his podcast. Uh, and just chow down on some wonderful mysteries. I know I'm going to go check it out myself. I hope you guys have a great rest of your day. And as always, stay mighty and keep reading. Are you an author? Do you know someone who is? If so, then message me, Ryan Oliver, at ryanmoliver.com to set up a free appointment to discuss being showcased on the Mighty Books Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure to subscribe to the Mighty Books YouTube channel and share the link to this and more episodes with your friends and family. Thanks for listening. So long for now. Stay mighty and keep reading.